Let's talk about salad. Hi, I'm Nina, and I really love salad. I love fresh foods in general. I love food trends, and I do love tea. So much that in 2014, I actually quit my corporate, well-paid job and started an organic lifestyle tea brand. I was ready to disrupt the tea market. There I was, living the startup life in the food scene of Berlin. My journey with tea took me to every corner of the passionate gastronomic world. And I could taste vegan burritos, superfood smoothies, or Peruvian ceviche. Isn't it amazing to have all these choices? Aren't we incredibly lucky? Let's take the hipster avocado egg sandwich. I had one for breakfast just this week, and probably some of you did too. Did you know that producing one kilo of avocados requires a thousand liters of water? A thousand liter for just two and a half avocados. This is just one of the recent food trends that has greatly contributed to an alarming water reserve reduction in the producing countries. Water, our most valuable resource. I came to realize how imbalanced the global food system was and how unsustainable our current lifestyles, including my own. Talking about water, 2.1 billion people don't have access to clean, safe drinking water. And here is another number from our unjust food system. 821 million. What does this number mean to you? This number is the reason that keeps me up at night and the reason why I'm standing here in front of you today. 821 million people are suffering from hunger. To put this into perspective, that would be one in nine of you. So although I enjoyed running my tea startup, contributing to global food trends, I realized I wanted to do something bigger, something that could have impact on millions of lives. I knew that the UN World Food Program was working towards ending hunger, but it was not until 2016 when I heard about the beginnings of the Innovation Accelerator that I knew I had found my place in the global fight against hunger. Here I could use my entrepreneurial skills to find new ways to increase food access for those people who need it most. My first mission at the Accelerator figuring out how people in the slums of Lima could eat fresh and healthy food. Lima is known as the culinary capital of South America and is thriving with some of the world's most celebrated chefs. Yet, thousands of people are suffering from malnutrition. How is this even possible? Even with Peru being one of the major exporters of fruits and vegetables, Access to healthy food is not a given for many families living here. I arrived in Lima expecting luscious green fields. To my surprise, all I could see was a sea of sand. No running water, nothing green here. And I was just outside the city center in the dry urban desert slums. An impossible place yet home for three million people. Here I met Merle, a young mother eager to provide her children with a better future. In the urban slums, Merle was not struggling with which superfood to buy. She just wanted to get access to fresh and healthy food for her children. Especially difficult living in an area where locally grown food is more of a fantasy than a reality and what was available was very expensive. How could we solve this? And could something as simple as salad really be the answer? Our idea was to use hydroponics. At the time, all I knew about hydroponics was 
that it's a way of growing food that does not require soil. And it turns out, you can also save up to 90% of water. Did you know that the majority of the tomatoes we eat here in Germany already come from huge hydroponic greenhouses in Holland? I just had to figure out how to bring this high-tech, expensive, energy-demanding innovation to the slums of Lima. Easy, right? That's what I thought. And Merle, a perfect example of an ambitious female entrepreneur, was fully on board. After all, being able to grow without soil and little water seemed a pretty good fit for a desert. Challenge number one, make hydroponics growing simple and self-sustainable in a place um, with high poverty, with low educational levels, and with limited access to electricity. My fellow WFP innovator Lucrecia, Merle and I set up a team with a common vision combining different skills to tackle this, ranging from more local mothers, teachers, a hydroponic university expert, a carpenter, and a nutritionist. We started by placing the real expert at the center of the design, the end user. Together with them, we decided to dive in headfirst and just start building hydroponic kits from scratch. Learning by doing was our division. Merle got extremely creative, making sure to only use locally available material that would be accessible and affordable. From wooden pallets over black garbage bags, styrofoam corrugated metal sheets or plastic cups. Our workshop at the community center soon became an unconventional testing garden. I'm not saying the path was easy. There was a lot of frustration on the way. Plants wouldn't grow, not everyone was convinced at first, and competition broke out between the different growing parties. It's a lot of work, and it does require dedication, but together we tested different ways of growing, and we celebrated successful solutions. Human-centered design in the slums of Lima. If you now want to grow vegetables just for your family, one to two square meters was enough to have a monthly supply of vegetables. We had successfully made it simple for families to have access to fresh foods, all while keeping the usage of valuable water at a minimum. And after three months, the initial investment could be paid back. Age to Grow, how we call our hydroponic program, is now being rolled out across Lima. Melly can now feed her kids healthy food, and she sells her produce at the local market. Little did I know, this was just the beginning. In Lima, we managed to green up the desert, but would this also work in other impossible places? It was time to find out. My next stop, the Algerian Sahara Desert. Vitalib, another friend of mine, a Sahrawi refugee and agricultural engineer. Talib is a true inspiration, a modern day superhero. He was six when he came to the Sahrawi refugee camps in Algeria. And he has been living there now for nearly 40 years. The Sahrawi people are traditionally nomads, and for them, livestock is extremely important. Livestock forms part of their culture, their heritage, and their history. Also, the meat and milk they produce is vital for human nutrition. But being completely isolated, the camps are 2,000 kilometers away from the capital and the closest harbor. They are dependent on external food aid, so people rarely have the means to feed themselves, let alone their animals. So reality very often looks like this. The animals have to eat garbage. I'm sure you heard the saying, you are what you eat. As you can imagine, the nutritional value of the meat and milk these animals produce is extremely poor. So malnutrition rates are high amongst the refugees. Talib's idea was to use hydroponics to grow food in the desert, again. But this time, for his goats. 
Why? For the local users, Taleb and his fellow Saravi, animals are the most important asset that they have. There are solar-powered high-tech containers that can grow barley fodder in only seven days from seed to harvest. With the use of vertical layers, Taleb would be able to harvest 100 kilo every day, enough to feed 40 goats. I thought, let's go big in Algeria and bring high-tech hydroponics here. The results of the test group were absolutely amazing. Goats that were fed with a fresh fodder produced 250% more milk than the goats eating garbage. Thinking about scale-up, we calculated that with enough high-tech units, we could ensure food access for the whole camp. But how could tens of thousands of refugees afford such a high-tech container with thousands of dollars? Could everybody run such a complicated system? This couldn't work. Had we failed? So back to the drawing board. We needed a sustainable solution. What was the magic key in Peru? Make it simple. Talib started to rebuild a hydroponic production unit using only locally available material. The investment for this local unit is just 10% of the one of the high tech and still at 60% productivity. Talib was happy, his goats were happy, the community was happy. By now, 200 of such local units are being built across the camps in different sizes and forms. And many people, therefore, now have access to more and better milk. The most amazing piece of this, however, is that these refugees, who had been dependent on external aid for over 40 years, can now take things into their own hands. Because change is possible, even in places where you would have never expected it. Today, they themselves can grow fodder, secure access food for their families, and they are being self-reliant. They are champions of the food system. But we're not only talking about food. Can you imagine how it is to live in violent conflict or having to flee from it? All of the countries of the Sahel Belt have quite similar conditions to the ones in the Sahara. And due to climate change, dry seasons are getting longer and harsher. Rainy seasons are shorter. Groundwater levels are dropping, and therefore grazing lands get scarce. The wars of our time will be about water, our most valuable natural resource. And it's already begun. The Darfur crisis that led to displacement of three million people and started in Sudan in 2003 was fueled by conflicts over grazing lands. I recently met a representative of Sudan, and he said, if you would have had hydroponics already 16 years ago, the Darfur crisis could have been partially prevented. So when I talk about hydroponics, I'm not only talking about the, about the growing food in impossible places. I'm also talking about the potential to help prevent conflict, to ensure peace and security. Nearly 400,000 Sudanese refugees live in camps in eastern Chad along the border to Sudan, having fled Darfur. Access to grazing lands is extremely difficult in dry season. And mostly the women have to walk for miles and hours to find fresh fodder. During those walks, they often become victim of violence or rape. If they can grow the food where they need it at home, these women can be safe. This January, together with Taleb, I went to Chad and I sat down with the Sudanese refugees to discuss the issues that they had around feeding their livestock during, during dry season. Taleb told his story from refugee to refugee and he said, if we can grow food in the Sahara Desert in camps established over 40 years ago, we can do it here in the Sahel too, in 14-year-old refugee camps. It was that moment when I knew we were on to something bigger. There was hope. 
In December of this year, in Eastern Chat, we will have set up 150 units, all run by female cooperatives. I'm happy to say that age to grow is active now in nine countries, having grown far beyond Peru, Algeria, and Chad. The hydro revolution is now greening up Jordan, Sudan, Kenya, Namibia, Mali, and Niger, all with slightly different variations of the solution. Our vision is 21 by 21, to scale this to 21 countries over the next three years. I know because I have experienced it, change is possible in the most impossible places. And every one of us can make a change. Everyone can have impact in ways that we couldn't even dream of. If you follow your passion, if you do what you're good at, all you have to do is take the first step. <laughs>